Well, good morning, and uh, thank you for joining with us today. Thank you for those of you who are worshiping with us online. We're in week two of this two-week series called The Good News. And we have kind of stolen the idea of that and even the artwork for uh, the series from that, from the YouTube series that went viral about a month into the pandemic um, called Some Good News by John Krasinski. Um, he, he rolled that out and it was stories that people sent in to him uh, via their social media platforms. And he kind of collected them and, and did this little YouTube show called Some Good News. But what we said last week and what we say again this week is, is we've rooted our hope and our eternity not in some good news, but in the good news. The word the it's just a small little letter. It's in, in grammar. It's called an article, but it's not just any old article. It's not a random article. It's not a generic article. It's a definite article. It's a defining article. It's, it's something that's absolute. It's something that is uh, identified. It is not an unidentified article. It's an identified article. And I say that because we had an interesting unidentified happening in our culture this past week. American Airlines flight 2242 flying from Cincinnati to Phoenix, somewhere around New Mexico had something weird happen because anytime something weird happens, it's always in New Mexico, right? Somewhere around uh, New Mexico, they uh, report to the aviation authority hey, what's up here with us? Like, what, what are you showing on the radar? And they said, nothing. What are you talking about? And he said, well, something just flew near us, and I don't know what it is, and it's not showing up on our radar. And here we are uh, on this, as of this Sunday morning, they've not identified what it is. Now, the reason the story became a trending story is because people write headlines in order to get you to click on it. So, of course, it read, unidentified flying object over New Mexico right? A UFO. Now, technically, the object was flying, and technically, it has not been identified. So that's not just clickbait. It's actual truth in the headline. There was an unidentified flying object. This morning, though, we're going to talk about, from the scriptures, a different kind of UFO. There is a UFO in our story this morning. It is an unidentified faith object, to which the Apostle Paul is going to speak and seek to identify, to not leave it unidentified. So I encourage you, please, to grab your Bible, if you would, this morning, um, and it'll be on the screens here. If you don't have one with you, you can follow along with us in that way. Um, and then we invite any guest who's with us today to join with us in our tradition. Uh, every week that we jump into the Scriptures, we hold it up in the air as kind of this sign of honor, and we say a creed together um, that describes what we believe about it and a prayer that prepares our hearts before we jump in. And so if that's where you're at in your faith journey today, then we invite you to join with us in that. There's no obligation to that. But even if you're worshiping online uh, at home, we encourage you to say this out loud. We think it's a good faith exercise, and it helps connect us a little bit. So let's hold up our Bibles, and let's declare this with some passion together this morning. The Bible is the Word of God. The truth of the Bible will change my life. Lord, open my heart and awaken my mind, and give me grace to respond. Change me for your glory and my joy. Amen. Thank you so much. We're going to be in the book of Acts this morning. The book of Acts, chapter number 17. Maybe your Bible calls it the Acts of the Apostles. I don't think that's a great name. It's the Acts of Jesus through the Apostles, but that's a longer name. So uh, just the book of Acts. Chapter number 17, um, again this week, I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation, just this story, I think reads really well uh, from the NLT, so if you're using a device or whatever, you can click on that. Um, Acts chapter 17 is where we're going to be this morning. We're, we're going to look at a, a sermon preached by the Apostle Paul that's one of his best known sermons, and some people have said that it's, other than Jesus, the greatest sermon that's ever been preached. Now, when, when these episodes of Some Good News by John Krasinski were going viral, those episodes were between 15 to 20 minutes long, right? But this sermon that we have recorded from the Apostle Paul is only about two minutes long. And some of you are like, yes, that would be the greatest sermon I've ever heard. 
regardless of the content. <laughs> if it were only two minutes long, that wasn't that funny, Jason. Get all of yourself. Um, you're like, it would be a miracle. I would believe in Jesus in a whole new way if you only preach for two minutes. It's not going to happen this morning either, but um, th this great sermon that we have the summary of that's only two minutes long, and, and it's, it, it's a sermon um, that, that we're going to look for the good news in this morning as we're posturing our hearts towards what God has called us to do, not just in our homes, in our families, and in the Metroplex, but around the world. Here's the setting for the story. It, it picks up in verse number 16. While the apostle Paul was waiting for them in Athens, uh, this is, he's gone ahead. He said, hey, send Timothy to me and, and Silas to me. He left Berea under some drama. He's waiting for the rest of his, his uh, friends to show up with him. While he's waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply troubled by all the idols he saw everywhere in the city. There were physical idols everywhere in Athens. He's troubled in his spirit about that. Verse 17, he went to the synagogue to reason with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles, and he spoke daily in the public square to all who happened to be there. Uh, next verse, he also had a debate with some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers. So he's talking in the synagogue, he's talking in the public square, and he's even meeting in these special gatherings of the brains of the day, the, the brain trusts of the day, He's gathering with these philosophers. When he told them about Jesus and his resurrection, they said, what's this babbler trying to say with these strange ideas he's picked up? Dead people don't raise themselves from the dead. Others said he seems to be preaching about some foreign God. And so verse 19, they took him to the, the high council, the Oropagus. This is not high council as in like governmental reign or governmental rule. This is high council as in the brains of the brains. This is the inner sanctum. This is the knights of the round table for smart people, right? That he gets invited into this honorable setting. And they said, um, come tell us about this new teaching. Verse 20, you're saying some rather strange things. If you've been around the story of Jesus for a long time, maybe you have forgotten, like I tend to forget how strange it is, that, that a person claimed to be God and then was executed like a common criminal and then got up from the dead. That's not normal. Do you know anybody else who's done that? It's so strange that his brothers believed he was God. Those of you who have brothers, you know how miraculous that is. It's strange, man. <laughs> we want to know what this is all about. And I love the parenthesis here. This is verse 21 is one of the reasons I chose the New Living Translation this morning. I love this. It should be explained that all the Athenians, as well as the foreigners in Athens, seemed to spend all their time discussing the latest ideas. See, in Athens, at this time in history, the worst thing you could be was out of touch. Does that sound familiar? The worst thing you could be is be behind the times, not up on the latest trend and the, the latest enlightenment. That's why I think this story and this setting is so imperative to us. Verse 22, so Paul, standing before the council, addressed them as follows, men of Athens. Doesn't that just sound so like men of Sparta? <laughs> like, uh, Anyways, men of Athens, I notice that you are very religious in every way. Doesn't that sound like a nice compliment? But we're going to circle back to that in a minute. That's actually a really sad phrase. You're very religious in every way. Verse 23, for as, as I was walking along, I saw your many shrines. And one of your altars had this inscription on it, to an unknown God, to an unidentified faith object. <laughs> There's our UFO in the story. This God, whom you worship without knowing, is the one I'm telling you about. What an awesome confidence to be able to speak to that confusion. 
Let me tell you about him. Verse 24, buckle up. Here's some good news, church. He is the God who made the world and everything in it. Since he's Lord of heaven and earth, he doesn't live in man-made temples. And human hands can't serve his needs, for he has no needs. He himself gives life and breath to everything, and he satisfies every need. For from one man, the man Adam, he created all the nations throughout the whole earth. He decided beforehand when they should rise and fall, and he determined their boundaries. Not a map, not a council, not a war. He established their boundaries. Verse 27, his purpose was for the nations to seek after God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him, though he's not far off from any one of us. For in him we live and move and exist. As some of your own poets have said, we're his offspring. And since this is true, we shouldn't think of God as an idol designed by craftsmen from gold or silver or stone. God overlooked people's ignorance about these things in earlier times, but now he commands everyone everywhere to repent of their sins and turn to him. For he has set a day for judging the world with justice by the man he has appointed and he proved to everyone who this is by raising him from the dead. End of sermon. Verse 32, when they heard Paul speak about the resurrection of the dead, some laughed in contempt. And others said, we want to hear more about this later. And that ended Paul's discussion with them. This is considered Paul's sermon at Mars Hill. This is is considered by some the greatest sermon that's ever been preached. And and we're going to talk about why. But I want us to first notice that, that the Apostle Paul starts by saying, I notice that you're very religious, but I want to tell you about something else. The good news is not religion. The good news is not religion. I will tell you I am a religious person. And I will tell you I'm trying really hard not to be. I'm trying really hard to be less of a religious person because here's what religion does. Religion says, here are the list of rules or the sets of rituals that you must follow to please an angry God. That is religion. It exists in every culture that's ever existed in humankind. Religion, an attempt for us to get to God. That's not the good news. The good news is that the God who we could never be good enough to satisfy came to us to rescue us, to set us free. That's not religion. That's good news. (laughs) I love what Louis Giglio said. He said, religion in one word is do. The good news in one word, done. It's finished. That song we just sang about aren't just words that we believe historically Jesus uttered on a cross. We believe theologically they changed the reality of human existence. And some of us have experienced that life change from the inside out in our own life. And we're still experiencing being set free from religious performancism, from trying to keep a list of rules to keep an angry God from striking us down. Instead, we're enjoying the goodness of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In contrast to religion, to trying hard, to working at it, The Apostle Paul offers the men and women of Athens some good news. And I I want us to to circle back and look at a couple of those, and and then we're going to talk about what that means for us today. I want you to look again at verses 24 and 25. Verse 24 says, He is the God 
who made the world and everything in it. The good news is there is a God. Be, because the, the, the Athenians there are, are stuck in this, this overwhelming number of many gods. The Apostle Paul said he saw idols everywhere, right? If, if you've traveled to, to India where there's 300 million different gods, where anything and everything can become a god, you, you see this overwhelming, which one's the god? Which one's the most authoritative? How do I keep all of those gods happy? And and in contrast to that overwhelming despair, we have the despair of, of the very opposite, atheism. Not polytheism where there's many, but there's none. There's no answers. There's, there's no God. And in the, the beautiful middle of those dis, desperate tensions is what we believe to be true. There is a one true God. He has revealed himself as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He is the, the God of the Israelites. He's the, the, the one called Yahweh. He's the one who is what he is. There is a God, and he's revealed himself, and he's the creator of everything that exists. And he's not just the creator. The verse continues, since he's the Lord of heaven and earth, he doesn't live in man-made temples, so he's, he's Lord He's the Lord of the manor. He's the boss. He's in charge. He's not just the creator of everything. He's the ruler of everything. Verse 25, human hands can't serve his needs for he has no needs. Anytime somebody walks up and says, God really needs me to do this. I'm like, not my God. I hate to burst your bubble, but he don't need you. You're not that big a deal. He didn't have a need, right? And then, then we see this. It's not that he needs anything from us. He himself gives life and breath to everything. So he's not just the creator of everything, and he's not just the ruler of everything. He's the sustainer of everything. That is who our God is. And in a moment where there seems to be so little answers, I'm just really glad that there's faith in a God who actually exists and has revealed himself. So good news is that God is God. And then if, if you remember from a few weeks ago, our, our three remain series, we said faith is believing that God is God and believing that God is good. Remember that? And that's why I love what the Apostle Paul says, listen, He's the creator, he's the ruler, he's the sustainer, and he satisfies every one of our needs. <laughs> Isn't that good? Because as the creator, the ruler, and the sustainer, he could really not necessarily have to be that good to us. He's earned the right to be like, work hard at it, minions. He's that big of a deal and we're not. And yet he's chosen to create a, a world where only he can satisfy the longings of the human heart. Man, he's good. And the reason I think that's so good is, is religion is about us trying to satisfy an angry God. Right? Every religion around the world, let alone religious behaviorism in the churches in America today, Religion is about trying to satisfy God. And the Apostle Paul saying, listen, the God that you're trying to satisfy really wants to satisfy you. Isn't that good? That is good news, man. Because I don't know about you, when I've tried to satisfy him, I have not done a good job. <laughs> it's been a train wreck. But when I've crucified the flesh, gotten out of the way and experienced the satisfaction of his grace, that's when I've experienced true living. He's the one who satisfies. Good news is that God is God and he's revealed himself as good. Here's, a, here's another piece of good news. This God is for everyone, everywhere, at all times. Verse 26, he talks about that through, uh, or, or 20, um, yeah, 26. He talks about how through one man he created all the nations. And then look at verse 27. His purpose for those nations was that we would seek after God. That's his purpose for every nation that's ever existed in the history of humankind. 
And I say that because if you grew up in church like I did, sometimes we think that the gospel is American or white. And that's not true. Like we, we've tried so hard to be a, a nation that celebrates religious freedom that sometimes we've accidentally conflated the ideas of freedom to worship God with we're the place on the planet where God's being worshiped the best. Listen, our story, this great experiment of religious freedom called the United States of America, we haven't celebrated a 250th birthday yet, but the story of the gospel has been being proclaimed for 2,000 years just fine without us. And the reality is it's not just been proclaimed for 2,000 years because really it was proclaimed in the garden. Seconds after the fall of humankind, we have the first whisper of hope of this one who would come, who would crush the serpent beneath his feet and bruise himself in so doing. And so really, before we were uh, kicked out of the garden, the gospel's been being proclaimed. He didn't need us to figure this out for him. The good news has always been global. And we live in this incredible moment in history where where we're getting to connect with the nations. During the pandemic, I've not been on a mission trip. I've not been anywhere. And yet I've preached more internationally than any year since I've been in ministry. Isn't that weird? Like, hey, will you get on this Zoom call and preach to some pastors? Okay. 200 pastors in India log on to this thing. And I'm preaching to these these exhausted and weary pastors that I've never actually met. How weird is that? Like we're in this great connected place that I think as Americans is meant to be a a humbling reality of check that, that we're not the source of the gospel. We're not the origin of the story. Jesus did not carry his cross to a hill in Lynchburg, Virginia. But when I was growing up, I kind of thought that's how it worked, man. There's like James and John and Jerry. Everybody in my age and older got the Falwell reference. And if you're younger than that, sorry. Like We really thought it was. And here's the deal. I, I believe God has blessed America. I, I, I'm really glad I live in America. I'm not America bashing and I'm not talking about some white guilt here in the gospel. I just think we need a giant dose of humility that the gospel was here long before us and she will continue to persevere whether our churches shrivel up and die on the vine or not. He doesn't need us. We get to be part of this in this incredible historic moment. What a gift and what a privilege. This is a global gospel of grace. It's for everybody. And the good news is not just that God is God and he's revealed himself and he's good. And it's not just that he's for everybody. It's that he's really not that far away. It's one of my favorite things the Apostle Paul said, that that God, the creator, the ruler, the sustainer, he has placed this global purpose on all of human history that we would seek after him, which is awesome, but it's so much better. It's gooder news that he says, psst, it's not that he's far away. Every other religion teaches that he's far away, and you better work really hard to get to him. And the apostle Paul's like, no, 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 I got better news than that. He came to us to save us from us. That's really good news. Every religion builds itself around a spirit of fear and intimidation. I, one of my favorite things to do when I, back when we used to get on airplanes and go places, one of my favorite things to do in a mission trip is I love going into any form of a house of worship. It can be like blatant pagan worship. I want to go inside. I'm fascinated by the human attempt to chase after their version of God. And matter of fact, stepping into a a temple of a different faith can help you learn more about the culture in which you're 
visiting in that moment than hours of study on, online. Anyways, most places you walk into are intended to intimidate you when you walk in. Even the old Christian cathedrals, they were built very narrow and very tall, and they spent a lot of money on artwork way above your head intentionally, and if not artwork, at least architecture, so that when you walked in, you could not help but go. Like it, it was meant to be, there's this, there's this big God. And, and, and I get that some of that it turned God into this distant stained glass and, and cold thing, but there, there is something beautiful in that where I do believe our generation and in our culture, we've lost the majesty and the grandness of God. And he's like way more of our bro than our Lord and whatever. I, I think there's beauty to recover in that. But the heart inside of all that is for generations, there's been this view of this God who was unapproachable. And what the Apostle Paul is, is, is telling us here is the good news is the red carpet. It's the welcome mat. It's the swing the doors open. It's the invitation of a holy God to unholy people to turn from their sins and come into saving grace. That's the good news. But the best news of all in this story that sets our news apart from every other bit of religious news in the history of the world is our God is alive. <sighs> Whole reason they wanted to hear more about what Paul was talking about is he talked about a God who, who conquered death and came back to life. And they're like, okay, we're listening. Tell us more. And that's how he ended his talk. Uh, verse number 31, if you remember, he talks about this day of judgment where we will give an account for whether we believe God was some little piece of stone or gold. There's this day of judgment. And this, this day of judgment will be carried out by the man that God has appointed. And God proved to everyone who this is by raising him from the dead. The resurrection is what changes everything that we believe. The resurrection is the defining event that changes our belief system from every other belief system is we don't just believe in a God who's the, the giver of life or the sustainer of life and not just that he offers life, but that he is life. And, and the good news is, is that that welcoming, that he's not very far off good news is still true today. And if you wandered into this place or you logged online because a, a loved one shared this on their, their video feed today or whatever, and you're like, hey, I want to know more about this. I want you to know something. Life is available to you today. You might feel like life is barreling over you or you're hanging on by a string. And I just want you to know there is a loving, good, and gracious God who is not very far off. He is close to you. He's available to you. And the good news is he's the life giver. He wants to offer life to you. And that's not just true for us today. It's true for every man and woman and child around the world, including the people who've never heard his name. And that's why we want the good news to be proclaimed everywhere, to every person, in every time. I want you to hear what I'm about to say, because this might not sound super deep, but this is super important to understand. We believe the good news is best told in the context of the culture. Say that again. The good news is best told in the context of the culture in which it's being proclaimed. Here's what I mean. The, the reason some people believe this is one of the greatest messages ever preached is because the Apostle Paul comes into this place that has idols everywhere. He sees this one that says, uh, to the unknown God. And if the Apostle Paul were living today, he would have pulled his iPhone out of the back pocket of his robe. He would have taken a picture of that inscription to an unknown God. And he would have waited to an opportunity, for an opportunity to say, hey, let me show you this picture. I want to introduce you to this God. And then he spoke with, with the language of their own poets, and he spoke in the language of, we call it contextualization. He spoke the message of the good news within the setting of the culture in a way that they would understand it. Does that make sense? Are you with me? That's why we send people 
to foreign countries to learn a culture, learn a language, learn a way of life so that they can introduce people to Jesus from within their own culture. It's, it's the reason that some of my best friends in the world have left the comforts of the American life and have left their loved ones and have gone to really difficult places to live is because they believe the good news is best understood in the context of the culture in which it's proclaimed. That's why people move to a difficult place and for years all they do is learn the language and learn the culture. Because the good news makes sense when it's communicated in a way that makes sense with the culture. I want to spend the rest of my life contending to not change the content of the good news and I want to fight equally hard to fight to adapt the context of the good news. I want to keep learning how to share the gospel with teenagers. And good grief, they are changing quick. If you don't know a Gen Z student, you just need to get to know them and find out how different their way of seeing the world is from yours. I want to spend the rest of my life learning the context of the next generation. Because I want the gospel to make sense in their culture. Does that make sense? It's the same reason we send the gospel around the world. And so here is some good news about the good news. I shared this with you last week. Some good news about the good news. And like I said last week, I just want you to know in the midst of the pandemic, not a single missionary that we support received one penny less than their monthly support from Temple Ministries in the last year. Praise God. Unfortunately, that's not been true of every other church that supports them or every other individual that supports them. A lot of our missionary partners are really struggling. The way that works here at Temple is every February, we commit to, man, what we're gonna do as a family to help the gospel go somewhere it otherwise couldn't go. And that sets our budget for the year. Our, our fiscal year for missions uh, runs from March through February. The week after we did our missions emphasis last year. We were told we had to stay home for just a couple weeks and it would flatten the curve and everything would be back to normal. Did I say that with some bitterness? We're not preaching about bitterness this morning. It's fine. The week after, and obviously it's been a difficult year, but the Lord's been merciful. We've, we were still able to fulfill all of our commitments to our missionary partners. Another exciting thing that we shared with you last week as well is we were able to participate in the Mana Mile, our partnership with Mana Worldwide, specifically the Jones family overseeing the feeding centers in Asia, which were tremendously underfunded because of the pandemic. We were able to do a fundraiser and, and raise $10,000 for our feeding centers in Asia this past June. Praise God for that. One of the other things that we were able to do because of your faithfulness to support the cause of missions is we were able to buy a mixer. I talked about it several weeks ago, but if you weren't here or if you've forgotten, I just want to remind you again, buying a mixer has never been a more exciting purchase for me. My wife and I actually have a pretty large mixer at home that sits out on our countertop, and I can't stand that mixer. It's huge. It's obnoxious. She loves it. So I've never been excited to buy a mixer before. But man, I was excited to buy this mixer because it's helping make American donuts in Kosovo, which is, is part of this new coffee shop that the George family, our, our ministry partners there, are able to open to where these young believers who are being trained up to be the new leaders at that brand new church, they now can be employed there and help build relationships with the community there in that place. And by the way, that coffee shop isn't just a coffee shop. You walk through a little doorway and it's where that church gathered this morning and proclaimed the name of Jesus in Paya, Kosovo. And I asked Dave to to send us a little video just so we could get a glimpse of that coffee shop. And so uh, I want you guys to watch this real quick. It's only about a minute long. Let's get a little glimpse of our mixer at work. Let's watch this. Oh, Welcome to Kosovo and welcome to our church plant space. This is our facility where our church meets. And we just opened a coffee shop here where we serve donuts 
and maybe bagels. Uh, this is, as you can see, it's a space where we can meet. Uh, it's a community space where people feel comfortable coming in and hanging out with us uh, over a cup of coffee. It's also uh, the same building where our church meets weekly. We do Bible study. We do youth group here. We, uh, every Sunday we meet and teach the Word of God. And uh, the idea is that the coffee shop um, would fund the church building and the facility because we pay rent here. Uh, we're here in the kitchen. Uh, here's a couple of guys making donuts. And uh, we can do this because you've purchased things like the mixer for us. And it's a small thing, seemingly, but it really has made a, a, a huge difference for us. So we just want to say thank you for giving uh, to this project and supporting the work here in Payam. Yeah. Some of y'all have been with us to visit Kosovo and you might have recognized some of the young men who were mixing dough and decorating donuts because they are young men who were not followers of Jesus when we first met them and we've prayed for them. Some of you have prayed with us by name and now they're serving Jesus and making donuts as a bridge for the gospel. How cool is that? Ah, that's good news. <laughs> that's that's the good news. I wanna share one more story, story of something God did with one of our, our missionary partners in the past year, because I just think it's an awesome story. I, I, I believe that we, I don't wanna get down this rabbit trail, so I'm saying that out loud, but let me, let me just say this real quick. We are so wired to look at everything through such selfish lenses, and so many of us are hardwired to, to view things like the pandemic through, through very narrow lenses about how it has affected us. And yet I would say that the good news has continued to be proclaimed through the pandemic. The unstoppable hope of the gospel has continued to, to, to be proclaimed through the pandemic and even in more exciting ways. Like, let's look for some, some good news in the midst of all this bad news. I wanna share a story about, I think, incredible news. And it's about the Hardin family. Many of you, if you've been a part of Temple for a while, you know the Hardin family. We've supported them for a long time. They've been here and given us reports serving God in India. This picture's actually a couple years old, but I really love this picture because they got their traditional Indian garb on. It's really cool. And um, Matt and Jessica and their four daughters, um, Reese and I have known them since 2000 or 2001. Um, awesome family of God. And let me, if you don't know them super quick, here's what their ministry looked like. It really wasn't a family ministry. They didn't go to do church planting in India. Matt was training pastors out in villages who have no access to theological training. Many of these guys, they, they came to know Jesus. They got a little bit of discipleship and they started proclaiming the gospel in their village and people started getting saved and they were the pastor. That's how it happened. And they're like, we don't know a whole lot about the book that we're teaching, but we're trying really hard. And so the way it would work is, is Jessica was really focused on, on the health care and the education care of their four girls in their flat in the middle of the chaos of India. And Matt would go out at least three weeks out of the month, usually four, where he would go to three or four different villages for about three days at a time. And during those three days in that one village, pastors from all around that area would take every penny they had to travel, stay all together for those three days a month to get theological training that they would take back to their village and teach for the rest of the month. The next week, Matt would go to another region, do the same thing for a whole region of pastors. They would go back, then he would go to another region outside of their city. And that, that's, that's what his ministry mostly looked like, out in villages. I mean, like, got diseases from rats scratching him at night while he's sleeping on the floor in these places. I mean, it's, it's, it's rough, right? His vision all along, though, has been that, that he could help build a digital platform to make this theological training more accessible. Matt's background is in IT. He was an IT guy at a law firm in downtown Atlanta when we first met. So he's good at all that stuff. When the pandemic began, he realized... If I'm gonna keep serving these men, I gotta figure this thing out. And because it's, the good news is best told in the context of the culture, he's not Indian. So he got together with some of his Indian brothers in Christ who are, are being raised up as leaders in that culture and said, help me build a website 
with these materials that I've been teaching to make them more accessible. And just a couple months into the pandemic, they were able to launch that website that all these pastors were able to get these materials where they were. Such an awesome thing. The next level of that vision is that that God would raise up national men, men who look like the pastors they're discipling and and speak the language without an American accent uh, into the lives of these other pastors. He started writing scripts for them. And because he's an IT guy, he's good at all that stuff, doing some really sharp videos, getting that teaching out to all those pastors at one time. Matt was figuring out the same thing we were trying to figure out about online school, Zoom meetings at work, how to do church at home. He's figuring out the same thing over there in that context. And it went, spread like wildfire. The first video they put out had over 2,000 views within the first week it was out. It's incredible. He was reaching more pastors with this training by it not being him doing the training. The pandemic forced them to kind of figure that out. And it's almost like there's a creator and ruler and sustainer who knew what was up. Because a a couple things happened this past summer. Number one, the, the Indian government used the pandemic as an excuse to purge itself of as many American missionaries proclaiming the gospel as possible. And the Hardin family was on that list of people who were their visa actually expired during the lockdown and there were no flights out of the country. They were there illegally, but couldn't leave. And so the, the door was closing for them to be able to live in India legally. And then at the same time, their second daughter who has um, diabetes, a pretty severe case of, of childhood uh, diabetes and, and suffers a lot of health problems. India is a really hard place to, to deal with those kind of health problems. And they weren't able to get shipments of insulin during the the lockdown and truly they just reached a tipping point uh, as a family of it's no longer healthy for us to live here and the amazing thing is it's had that happened in February of 2020 they would have left thinking our work here is done but because of the pandemic They left India, transitioned back to the States and are still continuing to write those scripts for those videos that are still going to those villages. And that work is still continuing from here. Isn't that incredible? And they were able to tell their supporting churches, hey, you don't have to support us anymore. We know finances are hard. That law firm found out that Matt was leaving India and called him up and said, hey, will you please come back to work for us? We'll give you more money. They gave him a raise to help proclaim the gospel in India. How cool is that? And the reason I think that's such a cool story is because it's a great example of the fact that the advancement of the good news will not stop until Jesus comes again. And we as the followers of Jesus have a great opportunity to be part of its advancement and to be part of its proclamation. So here's what that looks like at Temple. At Temple, we ask for folks to commit to a a 12 month faith promise commitment for missions giving. In faith to the promises of God, we commit above our tithes and offerings. And I'll just share with you what that looks like for for me and, and my wife. We tithe whenever we get paid. We give some designated gifts to some organizations and ministries that we believe in. But then we give to the general missions fund, the faith promise giving to the general missions fund here at this church. And it's what enables us to set a budget for the next 12 months to make sure that we can fulfill the commitments to our missionary partners who are still serving the Lord. And then if, if, if we're faithful enough and if we'll give as God has blessed us, maybe partner with some more missionaries. I got about a half dozen right now that I'm, I wish we could take on today. And as of today, we can't take any of them on unless some folks feel some leading in the Lord to to step up what you've committed to for faith promise giving. For some of you to commit to what you gave last year will be a huge step of faith. For some of you to give less than what you gave last year will still take a huge step of faith. I know people's circumstances have changed. So this is not about guilt. This is not religion. This is not about what you do so that God will be happy with you. This giving is anonymous. 
I don't know who gives what at all at this church, but for sure, we don't even ask you to put your name on your faith promise commitment. That's between you and the Lord. If you're married, that's between one another and the Lord. And here's how we're doing that this year, because we're not going to pass pieces of paper around and then collect them because we don't want this to be a super spreader event today. That's, that's not what we're trying to spread. We're trying to spread the gospel. Um, so we're going to ask that you please grab your phone right now. And if you text the good news to 94,000, it will send you a link. Not some good news, not just any good news, the good news to 94000. If you are worshiping with us online, there's a link right by this video uh, where our resources are listed. It gives you that same link that, that this text will send you back. Um, you can click on that. It's going to ask you whether you're committing to give monthly or weekly. And then it will ask you on the next screen for a dollar amount. And that's it. We're not asking for your social, for your middle name, for your maiden name, your mother's favorite pet. All that's between you and the Lord. But we're asking everybody who considers Temple their home. If, if you're just a guest today, please don't feel any ob obligation to participate in this. This is, for those of us who believe this is our church home. And so I, I'd ask that, that that's something that we asked you last week to begin to, to be talking and praying about that. And so if you're ready and you know what the Lord's put on your heart, go ahead and complete that right now. Click OK and send that thing. And, um, make sure you see the screen that says, yep, it, it went through. Um, that way we know what we can budget for for the next year. If this is something you and your family need to pray about this afternoon, we're not looking to rush you or put you on the spot, but we'd ask that you do so this week um, so that we can begin to budget for the upcoming fiscal year. I'm gonna say a prayer of commitment over this as I'm praying, the band is gonna make their way back up. We're gonna sing about the healing power of God. And at any point during that time, you can, you can fill that out. As we're doing that, there's gonna be some men and women in the prayer room in the back. If you need to talk to somebody about your relationship with God, you can do that as we sing as well, because we believe the good news is for you too. And uh, you can click the link uh, under those resources that says, can we talk? If you're online and not able to walk to the room in the back here. So for the rest of us, I'm gonna ask, would you stand where you are as I say a prayer of commitment over these faith uh, promise commitments, and then we'll worship him together. Father, we we give ourselves first to you, um, asking that you, you take these gifts and multiply them for the sake of the gospel going around the world. God, I thank you for 75 years, you've been faithful to let this church be a part of the gospel going around the world. And in this strange season of life, we're just seeking to be faithful in our chapter of the story that you've entrusted to us because we just believe that the good news is the best news that's ever been told. And we believe it's best told in, in the context of a culture. And so we want to do what we can to see that it gets there. So God, would you please speak to hearts? Would you give faith in your promises as we walk forward in this commitment? And then would you multiply it for the sake of the gospel? the sake of the good news. In Jesus' name.